Good day to one and all, and welcome to the 28th installment of Encyclopedia Hermetica, A Big History. Uh, today we're going to be discussing two extremely important characters in the landscape of Hellenistic thought, and by extension, all philosophical thought. These two guys and their respective philosophies would form a sort of intellectual mainstay to both the Hellenistic era and the Roman Empire. And this was throughout the height of both of their reigns. So that is for the next, uh, let's say, thousand years to come, as far as our chronology is concerned. Epicurus, whose name means ally or comrade, uh, lived between the years 341 BC and 270 BC. And Zeno of Kitium, who was more or less a contemporary of Epicurus's, having lived around 334 BC to 262 BC, uh, they were both philosophical greats in their own right. Now, if we had to slot these two distinct schools of thought on either side of the uh, quote-unquote official slash counter uh, history of philosophy, that is, the history of philosophy that the church and most schools want you to know, uh, versus the history of philosophy that the materialists want you to know. It's the philosophy of Zeno, which Judeo-Christian and Platonic idealism preferred, and it's the doctrines of Epicurus, which were thrown to the wayside. It's for this reason that only a few fragments and letters of Epicurus's 300 written works remain. Uh, this is a guy Dante put in Circle 6 of Hell with all the other so-called heretics, uh, his heresy being the belief that the soul is material and thus perishable. Now, because of this, much of what we know about Epicurean philosophy derives from later followers and commentators, but thankfully his message was simple enough that it's not rocket science to imagine what he would have believed concerning individual issues. There would be a whole current of Epicurean thinkers throughout history from this point on, so there's plenty that we can learn from them as well. So, Zeno was the founder of the Stoic school of philosophy, uh, which he taught in Athens from about the year 300 BC onwards. Now, his philosophy is called Stoicism for the sheer reason that it was taught in the Stoa, uh, which is beneath a sort of portico or colonnade. Remember, ancient philosophy was largely aesthetic in as much as it was ideological. Uh, where you hung out, how you dressed, who you spent time with, and what you did were all vital elements of how you quote-unquote did philosophy. Now, Stoicism was somewhat rooted in the moral ideas of the Cynics. Remember uh, our old friend Diogenes? Uh, he's been popping up every now and again. The guy who lived extremely simply, uh, like a dog, uh, masturbating in public and uh, rejecting everything civilized as corrupting. Well, at some point in his life, Diogenes was captured by pirates and sold into slavery, uh, eventually dying because, uh, according to one account, he ate a piece of raw chicken and it killed him. This is one of those classical uh, exempla in which uh, a philosopher's death is very much in line with how a philosopher lived. We're going to start seeing lots of these, uh, especially in the Stoic tradition. In any case, before he died, uh, Diogenes had a great impact on a guy named Crates of Thebes. Crates of Thebes himself passed on his knowledge uh, and he did so to our man of the hour, Zeno. Zeno's philosophy uh, would lay great emphasis then on the blessedness, the goodness, the peace of mind, 
that one could gain from living a life of virtue in accordance with nature. Stoicism, uh, to put it in brutally easy to understand terms, was like cynicism light plus Plato. Um, and it's this virtue loving plus Plato part which would immortalize Stoicism in the annals of Western history, while the Epicureans skulk in the distant shadows. For Epicurus, the, the purpose of philosophy was simple, and it was rooted in the materialist vision of Democritus. It was not about lofty idealisms or other worlds. The, the purpose of true philosophy was to attain eudaimonia, uh, happiness, and, and tranquility, ataraxia, a, a sort of freedom from fear and worry. Pleasure was nothing more than the absence of pain. And this pleasure could be sought by living self-sufficiently, surrounded by one's friends in a sort of quasi-monastic, rustic communal life. He taught that good and evil were essentially correlated to the principles of pleasure and pain. He taught that death is the end of both the body and the soul, uh, and therefore should not be feared. That gods exist, but don't care about human affairs, whether for good or for ill. He taught that the universe is infinite and eternal, and that events in the world are ultimately based on the motions and interactions of atoms moving in empty space. So again, like I said about Democritus, it's no surprise that very little written material comes down to us about Epicurus when his views are so blatantly offensive to the cosmology of the church, um, albeit not offensive to reason. So I just want to give a quick explanation of why Stoicism to a greater degree and Epicureanism to a lesser degree are relevant to the history of Hermeticism. And this will probably become clearer as we move through the material, especially when we start talking about the will. Um, Stoicism would share with both Neoplatonism and Hermeticism, but not Gnosticism, the belief in a single god, sometimes referred to as Zeus, uh, and at other times simply called the One, uh, this Stoic god was omnipresent and omniscient, but participated in the material cosmos. He or it was part of the divine fabric and yet was the divine fabric that made up the world. He's this sort of spiritual fire uh, hovering above the void, and a sort of imminent panentheistic being, uh, rather than a wholly transcendent being. In most aspects of Gnosticism, by contrast, God was transcendent, and the physical universe was typically considered an evil place created by an arrogant and domineering demiurge. Stoic ethics, and likewise hermetic ones, celebrated this divine force within the world. They were non-dualists. Gnostic ethics, however, were generally, though not always, austere ascetic efforts to escape the cage of this world and return to the light. You can see then how Stoicism and its slightly more ideological cousin, Neoplatonism, provided a sort of bridge for the takeover of Christianity, whereas Gnosticism was repressed and then driven underground. In fact, it was bits and pieces of Stoic thought that kept popping up, which made the Renaissance translators of the Corpus Hermeticum decide that their precious compilation of sacred texts from Hermes was an 
nearly as ancient as they first assumed. They'd been penned around the 2nd or 3rd centuries AD, uh, not the 12th century BC as had been first assumed. These bits and pieces included references to that model of mystical ascent, which, um, as far as I know, was first written about in detail by Cicero in his work Scipio's Dream. Uh, obviously, this model of ascent through the planetary spheres towards the Empyrean is much older, uh, going back to Egyptian and Babylonian traditions, but Cicero's account is quite detailed. It, it takes Aristotelian science into consideration, and it is explicitly, uh, quote-unquote, stoic. Now, the influence of Epicureanism on Hermetic thought is a bit more subtle, and not as direct. And you could say that it simply participates with Stoicism in this phenomenon, rather than being its sole contributor. Uh, what Epicureanism did, alongside of Stoicism, was provide another official vehicle, so to speak, for philosophical materialism. Epicurus's teachings were actually introduced into Roman medicinal practice by an Epicurean doctor named Asclepiades of Bithynia, who was the first physician to practice Greek medicine in Rome. Uh, he was all about the friendly, sympathetic, and uh, most importantly, painless treatment of patients. Epicureanism was a very popular philosophy, especially among educated upper-class Romans who just wanted to retreat to the countryside and live out their days uh, reading poetry, relaxing in nature, and living in silent contemplation. Now, <clears throat> because there were so many Epicureans and Stoics, there were likewise so many materialists, and for this reason it became a very difficult perspective to destroy, despite the eventual rise of Christianity. Now, this materialist current was eventually driven underground by the dualists, and it would only eventually re-emerge in Europe among the alchemists of the Middle Ages. Though these alchemists were not necessarily Epicureans or Stoics themselves, uh, they held to the possibility of a material universe. They kept this dream alive until it was picked up by the thinkers of the scientific revolution. To quote the Picatrix, Fiergi is about spirit in matter. Alchemy is about matter in matter. We could probably talk about the uh, utopian currents in Hermeticism too, which are arguably Epicurean, uh, but Plato's Republic is also a utopia, and that's the rival tradition, so yeah, it's not the strongest point. In any case, we're, we're getting ahead of ourselves. Uh, this, this whole process I just discussed, it, it unfurled over the following thousand years of our chronology, so I don't need to get into too much detail about what's happening in 400 AD when we've got plenty to work with here in the early 3rd century BC. All right. So first I will talk about Zeno, his life and his thoughts, uh, and then afterwards we're going to talk about Epicurus. Most of the details we know about Zeno's life come from anecdotes preserved in Diogenes Laertius's Lives and Opinions of Eminent Philosophers, which of course is not a primary document, it was, it was not written even close to around the time that Zeno lived, so everything in it needs to be taken with a grain of salt. And uh, just to be clear, this Diogenes Laertius is in no way related to Diogenes the Cynic, who we've encountered uh, a couple times now. In any case, this account gives us a, a legend that Zeno was initially a merchant. Then, after surviving a disastrous shipwreck, having lost everything, Zeno wandered into a sort of library in Athens. 
There he came in touch with some writings about our old controversial friend, Socrates. Zeno turned to the librarian and asked where he could find such a, a man as great as Socrates. And in response, the librarian told him about Crates of Thebes, the most famous cynic living in Greece at the time. I mentioned him in connection to Diogenes earlier. The influence received from Crates would lead Zeno to live a sparse, ascetic life. He dressed pretty shabby, and he didn't really care much about his appearance. Uh, one thing Zeno didn't pick up from the cynic teacher was his dog-like shamelessness. Like an old Zen master testing his student, Crates would try to pull pranks on Zeno in order to cure him of his perceived defective modesty. In one anecdote, Crates gives Zeno a pot full of soup to carry through the Acropolis. Uh, when he sees that Zeno is getting all bashful, trying to keep his soup hidden from everyone, for a reason unbeknownst to me, Crates takes his staff and smashes the pot, causing Zeno just to get soaked in lentil soup. After that, he runs away all embarrassed. Uh, and uh, this episode kind of makes me think of a scene you'd get in some terrible teen comedy in a, in a cafeteria. Anyways, so in 301 BC, Zeno began teaching in the portico of Athens's marketplace, which was called the Stoa Poikile. His disciples were originally called Zenonians, but I guess they got together for some rebranding or something, and uh, eventually became known as the Stoics, the, the guys who chill in the Stoa. It's said that Zeno declined Athenian citizenship when it was offered to him, uh, fearing that it might alienate those devotees of his in his native land, where he was also highly esteemed. Zeno was apparently of a serious, if not somber, disposition. He preferred the company of the few to the many, and uh, he hated overly flowery, verbose, and elaborate speeches. So, following the categories of the academics, that is, the, the official arm of Platonism in ancient Athens, Zeno divided his philosophy into three parts. Um, the first of these was logic, which is more so what we here would just call the trivium, uh, since it encapsulated all of grammar, logic, and rhetoric together. Uh, the word logic just comes from logos, which means word. The <clears throat> next of these parts of philosophy was physics, uh, ta physica, literally the natural things. And then lastly, we've got ethics, the end goal of which was happiness, and this could be achieved through living in accordance with nature. I should mention, uh, of these three categories, the logic and the physics became of increasingly less importance to most Stoic thinkers, and what we're left with then was a great deal of thought put toward ethics. Throughout the greater part of its history, Stoicism was much more the philosophy of the ethicist or the statesman than it was of the scientist. It's no surprise that uh, all of Alexander's successor kings were self-professed Stoics. It, it was a belief which was very conducive to justifying uh, the, the quote-unquote state of things. Uh, you know, I'm up here, and you're down there, and who are we to argue with the way God has made the world? That being said, uh, there would also be famous Stoics who were certainly not in any position of privilege, most notably Epictetus, who was a slave. But anyhow, what is it 
that we do know about these three epistemological categories, these, these branches of knowledge. Well, pertaining to logic, Zeno urged the need for a strong foundation in grammar, logic, and rhetoric for very much the same reasons that I do. Because the sage must know how to avoid deception. You need this strong foundation in grammar, logic, and rhetoric as a bullshit detector. Unfortunately, uh, there, there isn't much surviving as to the specifics of what Zeno believed about logic, and I'm afraid what does survive might just bore you. Now, <clears throat> as far as physics were concerned, uh, Zeno's view was that the universe is God. The universe is this sort of divine, intelligizing entity whose every part belongs to a whole. Um, and into this pantheistic or panentheistic system, Zeno incorporated the physics of our old friend Heraclitus, the man of fire and void. The universe was thought to have emerged from a sort of divine, demiurgical fire which foresees and permeates all things. This divine fire, or ether, was the basis for all activity in the universe, like a, a world soul of sorts, operating on otherwise inert matter. Now, in this somewhat epistemologically naive conception of the world, and, and of course we had to start somewhere, the, the primary substance in the universe comes from fire, passes through a stage as air, and then condenses as water, the gross part of which becomes earth and the subtle portion uh, becomes air, then rarefies back into fire again. We'll find this conception paralleled to some degree in the later four worlds of Kabbalah, um, Atzeluth, uh, emanation or fire, uh, Bria, which is creation or air, Yetzirah, which is formation or water, and Asya, which is action or earth. In the Stoic view, individual souls are part and parcel of that same fire as the world soul. Now, with the whole universe being this sort of fire, Zeno had an eschatological streak to his thinking in the assumption that the universe underwent regular cycles of formation, destruction, and the apocatastasis panton, the great renewal of all things. Everything came from fire, and onto fire everything returned. Now, when I say fire, for Zeno, this meant literal fire. Uh, he wasn't big on all these metaphysical speculations. Uh, he really only cared about virtue. And it was only at a much later point that Stoics started to take this fire more symbolically. Zeno had just been working closely with Heraclitus' physics. We'll see this sort of symbolic fire in a work like the Poimandries, which is in the Corpus Hermetica. So, the nature of Zeno's type of universe is such that it is an engine for doing what is right and preventing the opposite. Um, <clears throat> as it said, the moral arc of the universe is long, but it bends towards justice. There's a sort of primitive conception of natural law. Uh, a universe which unfurls according to Logos. And it's this Logos which is identified with fate, or as I like to call it, the way she fucking goes. Now, this whole business of this Logos, this rational ordering principle of the universe, this, this word suspended off in some other world, which acts as a formative principle to all things. Isn't all this 
awfully platonic? Well, yes, it is. And Zeno was uh, even charged by the Academy of plagiarizing their master's teachings. But the thing is, Zeno was an eclectic thinker, and he borrowed bits and pieces of everything he could get his hands on. The Stoic's ideal human being, his saint, was of course the one and only Socrates, the philosophical Christ who dies at the center of Western philosophy's history for all of mankind's sins. Everything about him turned the Stoics right on. His composure during his trial, his choice to drink the hemlock instead of committing an immoral act, his calmness in the face of death, uh, all wrapped up in that neat little bow of his moral inculpability. Socrates was also reputed to be uh, indifferent to heat and cold, you couldn't get him drunk, uh, he always dressed simply, he didn't wear shoes. These are all qualities for an ideal Stoic to emulate. They didn't take over the Platonic position wholesale, however. Uh, Socrates being largely an idealized mythical figure in the literary mind of Plato. Early on in their history, the Stoics were chiefly materialists, and they really didn't care about all this business of a transcendental soul. This would change for later Stoics, but this was a later development. Now, like the Cynics, Zeno recognized one single, simple good, which was really the only goal one should strive for. Happiness. So yeah, sure, everyone wants to be happy, but where did Zeno think this came from? Well, to Zeno, it wasn't just the result of an absence of pain. Uh, no, uh, happiness could rather be achieved through sound right reasoning. And this reasoning was simply letting one's thoughts coincide with the universal reason, or logos, which governs everything. So the more closely aligned one's thoughts were to the way things are, the happier one might be. The Stoic's job is to align himself and his will to cosmic determinism. Any negative emotions were thought of as, quote, disturbances of the mind repugnant to reason and an affront to nature. This consistency of emotion, this, this equanimity whence came all morally good actions, Zeno called virtue. The true good can only consist in virtue. Stoicism as a school of philosophy is ultimately a theory of virtue. Virtue is the highest good, and it is good for its own sake, not uh, because it's a means to anything else. Just as Zeno was too modest to be a cynic, there's a real modesty to his whole philosophy. Zeno deviated from the cynics who believed that things that are morally neutral could nevertheless have value. They thought things had inherent value in proportion to how much they assisted the natural instinct for self-preservation. Uh, but to Zeno, self-preservation and things that contribute to it only have a sort of conditional value. Food, clothing, shelter, these kind of things don't lead to happiness in and of themselves, since happiness is purely dependent on one's moral actions, one's virtue. And so, just as virtue can only exist in the presence of reason, Likewise, vice can only exist with the rejection of reason. We've got a sort of parallel belief in Buddhism. All vice and its ensuing suffering 
is the result of ignorance, and its remedy is reason. So, virtue stands in polar opposition to vice, and the two cannot coexist in one being. Now, just as an etymological note on the side about virtue, we tend to use the English word, which ultimately comes from the Latin word vir, or vir, uh, man, as in male or masculine, not man as in mankind. So we might think that our concept of virtue is somehow linked to a concept of masculinity. And it was to some extent, but we need to acknowledge that this is a later development. The, the Greek word for virtue, the, and let's remember that Zeno was a Greek, the Greek word for virtue was simply arete, which means moral excellence, and it's got nothing to do with gender. This is the R stem we find in Aristotle, or aristocracy, or Aryan. Uh, these words translate as a rule of the best, or most noble. The Aryan people are the noble ones. But anyways, that aside. In the context of Zeno's philosophy, all actions are perceived as either morally good or bad, and this is because the Stoic thinks that both impulses and desires actually rest upon free consent, upon the exercise of free will, of conscience. Pessimism, then, is an emotion you need to consent to. It's not a philosophy. So in this regard, so-called passive mental states or emotions are actually deemed immoral and conducive to immoral actions, because it literally means that a person is not exercising conscience. This is very much in line with the notion that all order followers, police and military and so forth, they're, they're all immoral because they do not exercise conscience. They simply follow orders. If you don't exercise good moral conscience all the time, then you're acting immorally. There's, there's an absence of applied reason, and therefore there is an absence of virtue. Quote, unquote, I'm just doing my job is never, ever, ever an excuse to the stoic mind. One needs to actively apply good conscience, and this, by nature, will lead to happiness. All right, so Zeno distinguished four negative emotions, and again, the parallels to Buddhism here may strike you. Here they are. Desire, fear, pleasure, and pain. Epithumia, phobos, hedone, and lupe. Um, it might surprise you to see pleasure on the list, but remember, there's a big difference between Stoic happiness and Epicurean happiness. Equanimity is what we're going for here. So, in this regard, there are three corresponding emotions which are positive. Will, bulesis, that is a sort of conscious desire, like the Thelema of Aleister Crowley. Uh, there's caution, eulabea, and lastly, joy, kara, which is uh, what Christians would come to call the joy of the Lord, or the peace that passeth understanding. It's not a matter of circumstance, it's a constant state of mind. It's a choice. People are typically happy because their life is in good situation. Uh, their happenstance is in good order. The joyful man, however, is like Job in the Bible. He, he sings hallelujah no matter what kind of horrible things happen to him. Now, as you may have noticed, there's no corresponding rational equivalent to pain since pain's opposite is just as illusory. So, as you can see, it's the Stoic's responsibility to root out errors 
and replace them with reason, thus generating eudaimonia or happiness, the, the good soul. So this is a philosophy of radical free will. Although materialistic determinism is taken into account, uh, how our consciousness is affected by determining factors is our choice. And for this reason, Stoicism is a highly empowering philosophy. You have to be able to first imagine that your will can always triumph over circumstance in order for it to actually happen. And Stoicism provided a vehicle for this type of imagination. If you're always looking at yourself as a victim to circumstance, you'll never fully unlock the potential of your will. So, yeah. If this all reminds you of the correct interpretation of do what thou wilt shall be the whole of the law, love is the law, love under will, that is, find your true will, which is really the microcosmic manifestation of the macrocosm's will, and then practice it with equanimity, then you're on the right track. To have virtue is to have will. Whereas the man of vice is like a dog on a leash being pulled alongside a moving wagon. Like I said earlier, Stoicism is a sort of theory of will, and this concept of will will be of increasing importance to our concerns. A wise man is only wise insofar as he exercises this will in the face of rampant vice. Cloistered virtue is not virtue at all. It, it has to be tested every day and this is how we might find happiness, by being that undiminished pearl, routinely trod upon by swine. This is the source of true freedom. True freedom happens when we're given hard choices to make, and then we make them, not when forks in the road never arise. All right. Well, I think this is a good place to switch over to Epicurus, because he saw things in many ways quite similarly, and yet in many ways quite differently. He was all about that cloistered virtue, which men like Epictetus, a slave, uh, Cato and Seneca, statesmen, and Marcus Aurelius, an emperor, would, would come to abhor. So, a few details about the man himself, since philosophies don't just arise out of a vacuum. And in this case, too, I should mention, Diogenes Laertius is our main source. So, almost everything we know about Epicurus, thanks to the selection biases of medieval copyists, comes from a guy that lived over 500 years after he died. That's like if Everything people knew about Christopher Columbus in 2,000 years came from a biography written today and none of his original letters survived. They'd probably end up believing Columbus thought the Earth was flat, uh, which he didn't, and neither should you. Now, Epicurus's parents were Athenians, but they moved to the island of Samos sometime before their son's birth in 341 BC. Um, as a youth, he studied the works of Plato under his tutor Pamphilus, and then he joined the army for mandatory military service to Athens at age 18. After the death of Alexander the Great, this Perdiccas guy we heard a lot about in our last session, he expelled the Athenian settlers on Samos to the west coast of modern-day Turkey. And so, after he compelled his military service, Epicurus reconnected with his family over there. He then began a lifelong love affair with the teachings of Democritus. In 311-310 BC, sometime around there, he
he began teaching in Mytilene on the island of Lesbos. But, uh, ironically, he was the source of some general strife among the people there and was forced to leave. After that misfortune, he founded a school in Lampsicus, and then he returned to Athens in 306 BC, uh, where he remained until his death. There in Athens, Epicurus founded the Garden, or uh, Kepos in Greek. Just like the Stoics hung out in the Stoa and the academics hung out in the academy, uh, the meeting place for Epicurus' school was his garden, a sort of mini pocket utopia in the midst of all of Athens' hustle and bustle. I think I mentioned in an earlier lecture that we can see the implicit hierarchy of philosophies in the Western mind when we consider that the garden, uh, kindergarten or le jardin, uh, and of course not the academy or the lyceum, is given over to the coddling of small children. I think we insult and dismiss Epicurus's thoughts when we use the name of his school to describe a glorified nursery. So Epicurus had a small but devoted following throughout his lifetime. He attracted a variety of characters, uh, a satirist, uh, a mathematician, other philosophers, and so forth. His school was actually the first of all the ancient Greek schools to admit women, and this was as a rule, not as an exception. As was traditional, uh, there was an inscription above the garden's gate, and it read, quote, Stranger, here you'll do well to linger. Here, our highest good is pleasure. And that was just it. Uh, the Epicurean sought pleasure. Not out of control, lascivious gluttony and self-indulgence, uh, but simply the absence of pain. Pleasure in excess always leads to pain and is thus best avoided. Uh, when you're hungry, you eat a bit of bread and cheese, and when you're thirsty, you drink some water. But, but you can see how this view differs from what we just discussed concerning Stoicism. Stoicism is all about the challenge. It was all about standing defiantly in the face of trouble with equanimity. To Epicurus, there, there was no reason to go and look for that trouble, because life would offer you up plenty of pain without having to go look for it. There would be plenty of sadness and loss even in the quasi-monastic confines of Epicurus's garden utopia. As we're told, and of course we have no way to verify it, uh, it, like with most philosophers, is, is an all-too-fitting end for Epicurus, uh, we're told that he suffered intensely from kidney stones, which finally killed him in 270 BC at the age of 72. Diogenes uh, says he wrote this on his last day. Quote, I have written this letter to you on a happy day to me, which is also the last day of my life. For I have been attacked by a painful inability to urinate, and also dysentery, so violent that nothing can be added to the violence of my sufferings. But the cheerfulness of my mind, which comes from the recollection of all my philosophical contemplations, counterbalances all of these afflictions. So, as we can see, suffering is, is often inescapable, so why make it worse for ourselves? This is why, in contrast to Stoics, Epicureans showed no interest in participating in politics, since doing so inevitably leads to trouble. Epicurus instead advocated seclusion, 
And this attitude is epitomized by the phrase la fe biosas, meaning live in obscurity or without drawing attention. That is live anonymously, uh, without pursuing glory or wealth or power, uh, enjoying the little things in life like food or the company of good friends. This is uh, the moral of the book of Ecclesiastes, uh, plus a little bit about fearing God, uh, and, and it's also the moral of the Hobbit. Uh, so what Epicurus wanted to do is come up with a sort of philosophical medicine, a drug, a, a, a pharmakos, with which he could relieve mankind from as much pain as possible. And so here's what he called his fourfold remedy, or more commonly known as his tetrapharmakos. Do not fear the gods. Do not worry about death. The good is easily achievable, and you will not suffer pain worse than you can handle. So, what is he saying here? Do not fear the gods. Well, he's not saying that the gods don't exist. Uh, in fact, he even thought that they were material, like the soul was material, but simply made up of some form of subtler matter. Epicurus felt that the gods, uh, although they existed, had no cares for mankind. They did not reward, they did not punish. They were off minding their own business in some horizontally conceived other world. If you remember back to my talk on mystery cults, you'll remember that superstition was growing out of hand at this period of time. And this first segment of the Tetrapharmakos was designed to fight this. Of course, Epicurus participated in all manner of activities related to traditional Greek religion, as did most philosophers, but he believed we should avoid having false opinions about the gods, of whom little can be known beyond the fact that they are blessed and immortal. Okay, so next, uh, do not worry about death. The idea to Epicurus was that if everything is made of matter, then the soul was likewise material, and thus it died along with the death of the material body. So you needn't worry about death, because once you're dead, you won't be conscious to know it. People around this period started developing a crippling fear of death, uh, hence the rise of savior gods and foreign cults. And what Epicurus was trying to say was, no, no, no. You don't need Dionysus or Osiris or Attis to come and save you. Once you're dead, you're dead. No myth of Ur, no shades in Hades, no halls of Amenti, uh, not even blackness, because there's nothing left to perceive it. So thinking about death and worrying is all just unnecessary suffering. There's an old Epicurean epitaph you can find on a number of tombstones throughout the Roman world, and they say, non fui, fui, non sum, non curo. I was not, I was, I am not, I do not care. And that pretty much summarizes this position. All right, uh, next. The good is easily achievable. This is a, a big one. This is a sort of challenge to the Platonists of the Academy, for whom the good was some sort of transcendent form which we could only get a glimpse of participation in, uh, but which was generally just outside of our grasp. To Epicurus, the, the good is basically the default. It's the absence of pain. So uh, when your eye is working 
best, you, you don't notice it. Uh, when you, your back is at its best, you don't notice it. it it's, it's when something is wrong that you experience discomfort, irritation, and pain. Right? So the best thing to do is to try to preserve the status quo. What Epicurus emphasized most as key ingredient to happiness was friendship. And it's for this reason that this school was really more of a community of friends living together under a philosophical rule. Uh, these days they might have been branded a cult and lit up by the ATF, but luckily they didn't have such problems. So yeah, um, the good is here and now. It doesn't need to be reached through mystical ascent. These are just altered states, not higher states. Be here now, to use the phrase popularized by Ram Dass's book. All right, so lastly, uh, you won't suffer anything worse than you can handle. The, the reason for this is because if you do, you'll be dead where there is no pain. Uh, we have this tendency in life to worry that the ceiling for pain, heartache, depression, and world weariness is infinite, which ultimately just causes us more pain. Worrying is like punishment for a future which may never come. So this is what the tetrapharmakos is designed to assuage. Don't worry about infinite suffering because it's a fantasy. All suffering has its limits. So we can see how and why Epicureanism was so inimical to the Platonic and eventually the Christian position. It said, sure, God might exist, but he neither does anything that affects you, nor does he care about you. It said, there is no afterlife. There is no immortality of the soul and that what's already around us is good enough, but there's no reason to be seeking things like cosmic justice or the kingdom of heaven or any of that gobbledygook. It's no surprise then that Stoicism, although also a materialist philosophy, would be received much more kindly in the so-called official history of philosophy than its cousin and rival Epicureanism. In Stoicism, there was panentheism. In Epicureanism, there was absenteeism. While Stoicism saw virtue as an end in and of itself, it, it did, after all, espouse virtue as the highest good. Stoicism was about the moral life, not the aesthetic life to use the Kierkegaardian categories. And this landed it in the nearly good graces of Christian thought. Dante's Inferno makes it perfectly clear. Uh, the shallowest section of hell is a gray wasteland of longing where live all the virtuous, uh, read Stoic, pagans. Epicurus, as I mentioned before, was not among them. Uh, his was a much deeper pit. Even in the Jewish Mishnah, it's written, quote, These are the ones who do not have a portion in the world to come. He who maintains that there is no resurrection of the dead derived from the Torah, and he who maintains that the Torah was not divinely revealed, is an epikoros. And let's not forget, this was written in Hebrew, so the concept that an Epicurean was a person who simply maintains that the soul is not immortal, and that God doesn't speak to men through prophecy, uh, basically a, a heretic, um, that had made its way pretty far, even in antiquity. In any case, uh, if these philosophies are of further interest to you, then I suggest you go read more about Zeno and Epicurus. Uh, I think you'll find that uh, the bad rap for Epicurus is totally unjustified. Uh, ultimately, these two philosophies, Epicureanism and Stoicism, are, are just two tendencies on a single pole. 
that is the polarity between the aesthetic life and the moral life, respectively. There's no way to determine which of these is the most logically correct or reasonable philosophy. Uh, you're just going to have to take a leap of faith as to which one you think is correct. It's, it's a leap of faith to assume that the moral life is the good life, and it's a leap of faith to assume that the aesthetic life is a good life. But it's a leap of faith every single person has to choose in order to function and operate in this world. So I suggest you think about it and uh, just remember that not choosing is also a choice. I'd like to thank you for joining me today. Uh, I'm Dan Attrell, and you've been listening to the Encyclopedia Hermetica, A Big History. See you next time.